Um, we, my husband and I lived in a loft, uh, 60 West 25th Street. Now lofts in those days were really cheap. You paid $125 a month. We had a floor through, a total floor, all right? And I had room for my studio, I had room for an office, I had room for people to change, and then we lived in the back. And that's how we lived until about late 1980, the people came and they said, you have to get out, we want your space. So my husband said, let's go to the Chelsea Hotel. And a month later, uh, they burnt down the space we were in. So that's how I landed in the Chelsea. Did I like it, to be honest with you? I never lived in a room. It was one room. I found it very difficult. But what I did like, I liked the people. I like, because that's what I do. Part of my life is gathering people around. So I had a party in the hallway. I must have been the first, because everybody said, what, a party in the hallway? And I invited everybody, and one person said to me, what are you inviting those people for? Who would do a thing like that? I love the camera, by the way. Do you like the camera? I talk to the camera, and I love it. I talk to the camera, anyhow. So how did you meet your husband? Ah. Oh. What a marvelous story. Here's a marvelous story, one of a kind. Uh, I was at a dance theater workshop, and there was a woman there. She was a sandblast Indian woman born in New York City from Brooklyn, but her father was from the sandblast Islands. Now, how was there a connection with my husband? He had dated her sister, I guess long before I came on the scene, for the hopes, I don't know. Anyhow, uh, she was having a party at her house. My husband was there, but he didn't come over to me. We're in di that's different times. Today, they're a little more, you know, aggressive. But anyhow, he went over to the hostess and he got my number. And I get a call a month later. He said, I'd like to take you out. I said, OK, why not? Why not? Uh, this was December 1962. So anyhow, we go to this little very dark place, and I said, what is this? He says, it's octopus. I said, okay, and I didn't really know, I didn't know what I ate. Anyhow, we, uh, after we went to his house, really, we weren't intimate. I should, I've been feeling this to people. It was a different, I mean, it was a different time, but he showed me his war pictures. You know, he was in the war. And for people, the war for that generation, the Second World War, was a real difficult time. I mean, really a killer. I love the man because he, he used to bring me paper sunflowers and poetry. I don't know if men do that now, but anyhow. Yes, it was very romantic. So one day he says to me, it was June 1963, he says, would you like to live with me? And I said, you mean get married? He says, okay. <laughs> And I called my mother, I said, I want to get married in September. <laughs> and my proper mother said, what do you mean? Because in our, our, what we do in our uh, type of thing, nobody got married like this. I got, I got my own wedding dress here. My mother did all the preparations and everything like that. And uh, I can't imagine, I mean, it must have been right for us because I, it was. It was totally right. I didn't know him that much. I didn't know him that long. But somehow, somehow, I think it was a love story, to be honest with you. I was married to him 37 years. I was head of the YMCA 64th Street Theater program on 63rd Street off Central Park. I was heading the dance program. Also, I headed the theater dance program. And they were doing some kind of lighting course. And my husband said, you know, I would love to do this. It ended up, as he did a few courses, there was a man, uh, Stanley Rosenberg. He was a director from La Mama Theater. La Mama changed the world. They, they didn't have a lighting designer for one show. And, and Stanley said to my husband, would you like to light it? And that changed everything. La Mama was started by Ellen Stewart. And one day, I think she was either a cousin or a brother or not, I'm not sure of that, he wrote plays and he submitted it to one of the big guns in Broadway. They stole it, they stole the concept. And Ellen said, no more. Do you miss your husband? Yes, I do terribly. 
I do more than ever. Yesterday would have been 55 years I was married to him. Yeah. And I'm tell you why. Um, I had a, an attraction to someone in the past several months. He came back from my operation, younger man. And I don't tell people, and I don't, I'm not mentioning names, where he's from or anything like that. It's a different world today, okay? This man had never married. Um, I don't know what his connect, but anyhow, I tell this because I'm only telling, I don't talk to the person of anything. But uh, I think I was very vulnerable because I had come back from an operation. But he was very kind to me, and um, I knew him a couple of years. But the mores are entirely different, and, and being with my husband was a di you know, how I met him, how he lived, the creator, because people always said there was a big connection between us, and there was. And so uh, when I thought of him, I tried to pine for him. I, I think that it was, you know, you can't put the energy into other people. They're different. Mine was a special thing, and so, you know, I didn't have, and thank God I didn't have to deal with all that at that time. Really, truthfully, it would have been very, I think it would have been hard. Maybe not. I was blessed with a family that gave me culture, all right? I was, I had, a lot, I had lamb's tail. Uh, I had, I started piano lessons at six years old. And I, until 17, I was playing concertos. And then my parents took me to the Royal Conservatory of Music. And let me tell you, uh, I was four years old, and, and everything in Toronto was royal. It was very British. Royal that, royal that. So this was the Royal Conservatory of Music, which was great because I had a lot of very great teachers, okay, with terrific classical backgrounds. Very blessed to, be, to have that. And um, I remember looking at a wall, and there was these signs, you know, music, and so we said, go across the floor. So then they had like a stage, and I'd kind of crawl up there, bang on the piano, and she said, you'll be a dancer or a pianist at that age when I was very young. As time went on, I got involved in a high school, very progressive high school. And they had the Modern Dance Club. I was, what, 13, 14, something like that. And I said to, uh, I said to the teacher, I want to do more choreography. I said, how do you do that? She said, you have to go to New York. I mean, it was, and that planted in my head, the seed. In fact, in our house, we had a chandelier in the dining room. And overhead was my room, and I would jump in my, the thing would shake. I said, don't do that anymore. I used to imagine, I used to like to choreograph used to do creative things. But this, inside of me, I knew I wanted to leave Toronto. I couldn't be there. I, I said, no, I cannot do this anymore. I feel the universe pushes you when you... When I was... I had did some work with Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and I happened to go into a restaurant, and across the way was Royal Theatre. In walks two women. One was Japanese, the other was like a Hispanic. And they had been uh, dancing at this place called the Flower Drum Song. It was very popular in the late 50s. It's, um, it was a Broadway show, and we're talking. And the woman who was Hispanic says to me, when you come to New York, you have to stay in my house. I mean, that is really incredible. Well, how did this happen? So one day, my parents went to Florida. And uh, there we had someone staying with my sister and I while they were away. And something happened. I said, I've got to leave. I've got to leave. And I left. I, I, got, I packed up a trunk and I sent it ahead. And I ended up at, in the projects in New York. If you know anything about projects, in those days, the projects were fine. Today, it's a problem. But I ended up the projects at this woman's house. Some people are just technically to spend their lives as a dancer, okay? That's a technician or choreography. But there are choreographers have written books, poetry. You know, I did a program where I went to schools, I went to some colleges, where I had people moving, uh, using movement as the force to express different ways of uh, speaking, you know, uh, dancing, drama, okay, because it's from the body. Now, 
if you're going to spend your life doing te technical, that's different. Like if you want to specialize in being a, a you know, speaker, or you're then people specialize in that. But there's a way to be very spontaneous where they can move as a unit. And I see that in people too, okay? Like some people react to people, they do things to them. They have, but I've seen the people that are kind of bullish and like this, they have gorgeous sides to them, the most wonderful sides to them. And I think that that's part of it. But I think some people uh, judge people uh, like right away now, certainly if a person is a killer or whatever. But even that, why did they kill? You have to find out. They probably have a side to them that's extraordinary. No one ever really explored it. And I have read poems. Uh, I wrote a poem about a cat that I sat with. I know a cat named Lucia, who sits very close to Mia. She changes her mood when she wants her food, and she lets me sitting on the Sophia. I happen to like limericks. I have another one that says, uh, when I was in the hospital, I know a, I know a nurse named um, Liz, who's in the medical biz. She loves her work among all the jerks, but she goes home and drinks gin fizz. So I happen to like limericks. I, I find that's kind of fun. So I've always touched about the Syrians coming across on the boats. I have found, I guess it was Syria, isn't that where, yeah, where they, I, I, think it's, I think that's the most extraordinary thing. But I think it was the most extraordinary thing when our grandparents came over in boats from various places to come to this country and Canada. Must have been very difficult. And I wonder if today if people really realize what hardships people have gone through and whether the families will share it with them. And uh, I came at a time when there was the Black Revolution. And when I was in the 1950s, my father took my sister to like to drive to Florida for a holiday. And I will never forget, my dad used to get very black, very dark. And he was coming home, and they wouldn't let him in the restaurant. This was the late the 50s, because they thought he was black. And he said, no, I'm not black. I'm, I got black from the sun. And he had to show him his identity. And I remember as a child, and I find that very, that was something. I remember uh, down south, that what was happening with people. So I. You know, and I came here, and I had a company. My first company was black and white. I had no understand. I, to me, I had no prejudice. Uh, it was important to me. But they were dancers, and no one bothered us or said anything about black and white. They were brilliant people and everything. But you know, I know what's I know what's happening. I was born Jewish, but uh, in Toronto there was problems. Um, but what happened was when um, people, my family generation, when they could afford, they, do, they moved out of communities and they went up, to, up north. Up, they called it Forest Hill and mainly, there were, mainly it was Jewish people there. Now it's all mixed. But they, and they got up, they were upper scale. They began, you know what I mean? Upper mobile people and they made themselves an enclave. At that time, they had to, it was the 50s, it was a different time. People say, are you this, are you that? I've learned to, I like to kind of meld things together. I like to be connected. It's that thing that I have with people. I think if you stop having to change, I think you die. I really think life is you have to keep growing and changing. It's very hard. Life is, it's not an easy thing. Chelsea was a sewer. Chelsea had prostitutes. It was dirty. New York was so dirty when I came here. Broken down, dirty. It was out of this world. They had 42nd Street, all this smutty, you know. Uh, it's cleaned up more. I mean, New York can never really totally clean up. You see, they've taken bookstores away. We used to be able to go into bookstores. We didn't have many bookstores. I like to, I wish we could, we used to go into Barnes and Noble in the 6th in the Sixth Avenue, just read, and there was one downtown, and I miss the bookstores. I miss going to the bookstores. Do you think it's still creative? Still what? Creative. Who's, oh, you mean? New York. Yes, well, of course. It's a sea, yes. Yes, because you just have to sit and look at people. I can look at people. 
I mean, I can just look at the people here, and it's very fascinating. My husband used to say, don't talk to everybody, you talk to everybody. But you learn a lot. I want to go, if I die, I want to die, as they say, with your boots on. I'm not, I'm going to do that. That's how I'm going to, pa I'm going to maybe be in a travel, work. I'd love to work in different countries. I'd like to bring my work to different countries. I'd like to teach. I'd like to go back and do more work. No, I just want to keep creating and working. And that's what I want. That's my future. I wanted, I'd like to do new work. I really would.